Infrastructure has been a sore point in Africa's development agenda and more countries on the continent are working to change this narrative. So how easy will this tax be and what role will the new Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement play? Joining me in the studio to discuss this is Rola Keakikubwe Filani, who Chief uh, Commercial Officer at uh, Mixta Africa. Mrs. Filani, it's good to see you on the show. Uh, welcome. Asma, good to see you again. It's good to see you again. It's been a long time. So uh, Africa is still running a massive infrastructure investment gap annually, $130 billion, $170 billion, somewhere in between. That is according to the EFDB. Were there any significant success in 2020? And what will spending on infrastructure look like in the new year? Yeah, thanks very much for that. And in fact, when you take into those figures put out by the AFDB, what it doesn't actually reflect is the additional investment required for infrastructure services. That is the management of infrastructure that is built. So we're looking at perhaps a gap in the years to come of 200 billion annually. But looking back over the last 12 to 24 months, I think there have been some notable projects. One of the ones that particularly stand out for me was this 1.5 gigawatt uh, solar park in Egypt that required funding of 1 billion dollars in infrastructure financing and brought together a consortium of international and regional financiers, including the Africa Development Bank. It's going to significantly change the power infrastructure landscape in that country. And there have been a few additional uh, points of progress made on railway infrastructure. Uh, we've seen some significant progress on the Trans Maghreb Highway in North, uh, in North Africa. There's also the Mambilla Power Plant in Nigeria, as well as the Nairobi Naivasha Railway System that's currently underway in East Africa. So we're seeing all the right signs. We're hearing all the right noises made on infrastructure development on the continent. But clearly, the COVID-19 pandemic environment has really stalled plans. Um, across many economies. So of these large infrastructure uh, projects, uh, which of them do you think hold very significant uh, uh, promise to contribute to the growth that we need for industrialization uh, on the continent? Uh, and if you could touch on uh, those sectors like uh, housing, you spoke about the solar projects in, in Egypt and transportation, the, uh, the uh, uh, rail line in, in East Africa, or Kedia, by the way, but I'm sure there are a few other projects there. In, is there anything you've seen in Southern Africa, in the northern part of the continent or the western corridor? Yes. It's important to bear in mind that uh, for infrastructure investments to actually contribute to sustainable growth, and now, you know, in this environment, we're talking about the green recovery, it actually has to contribute to key sectors such as manufacturing and job creation. Um, some of the re research made by the World Bank recently showed that Every one dollar spent, one million dollars spent on infrastructure investment will create 100,000 jobs and significantly more indirect jobs. I think the ones that are particularly interesting for me now, because I'm now looking at the affordable housing space, is really housing construction. When we look at some of the projects we have deployed, um, if you look at upstream demand for housing materials, such as cement and all the inputs that go into building roads, um, we're looking at signi a significant impact on job creation and beyond that, the manufacturing sector. I'm particularly excited by the Africa Free Trade Continental Agreement because it means that we're going to create a market of almost 1.5 billion people that will be trading with each other. And as we know, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we faced disruptions to global supply chain. So we might see a situation where we can actually retain much of the local value around sourcing of inputs for key infrastructure projects such as housing within the African continent. And I think if this trend continues, we will see significant contributions to economic growth from the housing sector. The other sector that I think is a key game changer when it comes to economic growth is uh, the power sector. As we know, we face crippling power shortages, not just here in Nigeria, but across the continent. And I think we, we're seeing a real push to increase capacity within transmission, uh, broaden and widen the distribution network across the continent. And I think for large-scale industrial projects, we're going to need significantly more investment in, in pipeline infrastructure, in gas infrastructure, to really trigger and spur that sustainable and lasting economic growth that we see. I think power and housing will be key. And of course, transportation, which actually helps to link all those things together, is also going to be very, very important for sustainable growth. 
I see. So you're talking now to the high five uh, 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 pillars of the of the EFDB. So again, when you look at what's the outlook there for uh, for uh, affordable housing in Africa in 2021. Uh, yes, we'll use local materials. We've seen some examples in Rwanda, for example, and a bit of that in South Africa. Do you think we can move this all the way up in which the governments, uh, the, all the sovereigns can see this as the key to unlocking this major deficit on the African continent, housing 1.2, 1.3 billion people? And in fact, those 1.3 billion people, uh, uh, Boisson, translates to about a 50 million unit deficit in terms of housing structures. But I think the other thing that really will affect the outlook for housing this year is the spending power of consumers and consumer finance. As we know, when we're looking at the market, we're looking at both demand and supply side factors. I already spoke to some of the supply side factors, such as on, on the cost of construction and the cost of building, as well as the sourcing of affordable inputs into building. But on the demand side, what we need to see is really a competitive interest rate market and a stronger and deeper financial ecosystem around mortgages. Affordability is a key driver of affordable housing uptake. And for developers like Mixter, you know, the cost of land Land and the cost of infrastructure will constitute anywhere from 20 to 30 percent of your total project costs. So the question is, how can we bring those cost input costs down? I think one of the things that we'll need to see more this year is public-private sector partnerships, but also from the financial uh, services side, uh, we need to see more and more effective mortgage system. We already have quite a lot of schemes with the National Housing Fund scheme, for instance, here in Nigeria, which is being uh, sponsored by the Federal Mortgage Bank of Nigeria. We're seeing some significant progress in that. We're also now seeing a lot of commercial banks on the continent now rolling out uh, affordable home schemes and payment plans. As we know, home ownership is aspirational, but beyond your ability to afford a home is also your ability to afford all the services and upkeep that comes with owning that home. And more especially, you know, housing is not this sort of esoteric thing that exists in isolation, the connectivity of the railway and the transport infrastructure around your housing unit will also determine how affordable it, it is for you. If I need to get here from here to work, is it an affordable transportation system? All of those things really impact the affordable housing landscape in, in Africa in 2021. And I think we have to very much look quite closely at consumer finance options in order to make that a more realistic prospect for the average African consumer. So, so you will agree with me that the sovereigns across Africa don't have the deep pocket to provide that 50, those 15 million housing units. So there comes your doorstep at Mixta, for example, uh, Mixta Africa. So you bringing up the money. So who you be working with? The local banks, investment banks, DFIs, multilaterals, uh, 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 and, and others. Where do you, how do you think we can deep in this? I think to some extent, Boasna, you've actually highlighted some of the key stakeholders. I think from a demand side perspective, we've been working very closely with, with institutions like the Federal Mortgage Bank of Nigeria, like the Federal Housing Authority. There's some really fantastic uh, uh, public-private partnership projects coming out. But we also see uh, local banks as key allies, uh, particularly now rolling out more affordable mortgages. And some of them are getting international credit lines from development finance institutions. We also have organizations like DFIs, like Shelter Freak and the AFDB who are looking at these projects. And if you recall the Egyptian uh, solar project that I referenced before, one of the interesting things about that project is that beyond having uh, structures like the Africa 50 Fund backed by AFDB on that deal, you also saw the North Fund, the Norwegian Development Finance Institution, as well as the Islamic Development Bank and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development come together to fund that project. And I think that that is the model of financing that we would like to support more and advocate more within the housing space. And a couple of our projects across Africa are actually adopting that sort of partnership and collaborative structure going forward and actually really making impact. If I may quickly cite the example of one of our projects in Morocco, which actually has contributed 6,000 jobs to that economy and an additional 15,000 indirect jobs. We've been able to find structures that allow us to raise funds 
funding through project finance locally in some of those countries. Um, I was waiting for you to mention Morocco because once you touch on Egypt, the next destination is Morocco, by the way. Not just in housing, but in, in, in gas, in energy, in solar, wind projects and all that. But when you come down here to West Africa, in particular a country such as big as Nigeria, uh, you mentioned the EBRD, the European Investment Bank and other partners at the Africa 50. We don't see much of those partnerships here, working around here for affordable housing. What's the problem within the Nigeria space? Is it fiscal? Is it monetary? What is it? Yeah, that's a very, very good point because housing finance, development finance for housing hasn't been that prominent in Nigeria. And I think part of the challenge is just the structure and bankability of transactions. As you know, with any viable infrastructure uh, uh, a project, there has to be a market. There has to be a consumer market. And I've talked about, you know, we've talked about the 17 million housing deficit in Nigeria, which is the market. But the presence of a market is not necessarily the presence of effective demand. And effective demand has to be affordability. So what I think will work for a market like Nigeria is for those people and those institutions like DFIs who will finance the project to start looking at credit funds that could extend affordable mortgages to the offtake market, which then takes care of a key part of project risk and project bankability. But the other thing I will, of course, say with, with financing projects locally is actually de-risking those projects. And one of the things that I think would really actually emerge in this market is the public-private partnerships where, for instance, governments, subnationals can come in by contributing land as equity to those projects, which significantly de-risk the project and make them more cost-effective. And perhaps then the DFIs coming in with credit enhancement and guarantee structures, particularly on the market and the offtake side. I think those structures are viable and we're already having a lot of conversations to engage with that. We ourselves have embarked on a fundraising plan which we we believe will be successful and will serve as a model for funding for the affordable housing and real estate space as well as the hospitality market in, in years to come. Rolake uh, Akikubwe Filani, thank you so much for coming through, Chief Commercial Officer at Mixta Africa and, of course, an investment banker. See you some other time in the future.